So on a reef, deep in the South Sea, there was an oyster. And the oyster had dreams of finding a treasure. He had heard about treasures buried in the sea, so he decided he wanted to find his treasure. So he decided to go on an adventure. He extended his foot-like muscle and grabbed a hold of the sea floor and pulled himself forward. Extended that foot-like muscle again and pulled himself forward and he was on his way. Along the way, he met all kinds of animals. He met octopus and dolphin and whales and, and all sorts of fish, angelfish and, and pufferfish. And he met eels, he met crabs, he met all kinds of fish and animals from the ocean and they all became his friends. He had a wonderful experience, except for those pesky pieces of sand. They kept getting in his shell and irritating him, and he had to continually stop and spit them out. All along the way, he had to spit out that sand. Well, he kept going and he kept meeting people, and one day, a strong wave carried him to the shore. Well, oysters don't live very long in, this, in the sand. They need the water. Not too far away from where the oyster landed was an older man and a young boy. The young boy went up to the shell and picked it up and said, Grandpa, what is this? And the older gentleman said, Well, my boy, that's an oyster. Do you know that if you put it to your ear, you can hear the sea? So the boy put the oyster to his ear. He said, Grandpa, I don't hear anything. Try again, but this time, listen with your heart, said the grandpa. So he put the oyster back up to his ears. I still don't hear anything, Grandpa. So the grandfather said, let me try. So the boy gave the grandfather the oyster, and he put it up to his ear, and he smiled, and then he pitched this oyster way back into the ocean. He said, Grandpa, why did you do that? And the grandpa said, well, that oyster wasn't going to live very long here on the sand, so I gave it a second chance. Well, the oyster found itself back in the sea, and he had his hope renewed. He kept walking, he put that foot-like muscle out in front of him and pulled himself over it, and there again, more sand. <laughs> sand everywhere, and it was such a pain, it was so irritating. Well, the oyster kept going until he found a beautiful coral reef. And at the edge of the coral reef, there was a box, and it sparkled under a ray of sunlight. He thought, oh my gosh, there's my treasure. And he made his way towards the box, but you know, there was a squid who had been watching him. The squid swam down, grabbed the box, and picked it up, opened it, and there was a gold coin inside. Ha ha, it's mine, said the squid. He grabbed the coin and took off. Well, the oyster was very disappointed. Disillusioned, oh my gosh, he said, all of this work, this whole adventure, and I get nothing. It was all for nothing, I can't believe it. Well, there was a turtle hanging out on the reef and the turtle said, Oyster, don't be sad. You've had all kinds of great adventures, think about that. All kinds of wonderful experiences. And so the oyster said, you know, you're right. I've met all kinds of sea creatures and made all kinds of friends. And the only problem was that pesky sand. And the turtle said, you know, the sand might have done you a favor. You're in search of a treasure, and I'll bet you if you look inside, you'll find a treasure. I probably don't need to tell you what kind of treasure he found inside the shell. But the truth is, that pearl might be precious, but the journey was the real treasure. Now, I'm a scuba diver. Anybody here dive? The ocean has delivered many, many treasures to me. I was in Florida, in the Keys. It was 4.30 in the morning and we were boarding a dive boat. We were going to see how, Seahorse Gardens to see some seahorse that morning. And the dive master had told us we had to get out there before the sun came up because that was when, if we were lucky, we might see some amazing behavior. Well, we were really lucky that day. We got under the water and the sun started coming up and it wasn't five minutes before I saw a seahorse. About six inches long, it had its tail wrapped around a piece of sea glass, sea glass, sea grass, and I almost didn't see it, except it unwound its tail and started to move. That's what caught my attention. And it swam out into the water about a foot or so, 
And then, to the left, I saw another seahorse unwound, unwind its tail and swim towards that first seahorse. Well, the two seahorse wound their tails together. They touched noses, and they moved in a circle. It was a beautiful dance. And I watched them for about 10 minutes. It was absolutely amazing. When we got back on the boat, I asked the captain about the behavior of these seahorse, and he said, you were really lucky to see that. He said, this is a ceremony almost, it's a ritual that seahorse do. They made for life. And every morning, they recommit to each other. Every morning, they recommit. And when they're mating, they'll do that dance for eight to ten hours. But every single day when the sun comes up, they wind their tails together, to touch noses, and dance to reaffirm the commitment that they lead to each other. I love that. Don't you love that? I love that. <coughs> In the Cayman Islands, there's a place called Stingray City. Anybody been there? It's a popular place for tourists because it's a cove. And in that cove, for hundreds and hundreds of years, fishermen used to come in there because it was protected. And they would clean their fish and throw over the heads and the tails and all the parts that they didn't want to sell. Well, the stingray really quickly learned that they could get a great meal by coming into that cove. So they came day after day and, you know, pretty soon, they learned that they never had to leave. There was always food there. Well, when the fishermen left, the locals decided they needed to take care of those, those stingray. So they started to bring people there to snorkel and watch the stingray, but they still had to feed them. So the boats brought snorkelers and divers. The divers would go down and feed the stingray, and the snorkelers would hang out on the top and watch. So I was in the Cayman Islands, and the first dive of our whole trip, where did we go? Stingray City, because those stingrays are acclimated now, right? They're conditioned. They don't get any food except for what the fishermen and the divers feed them. So, I had to put on extra weight, go you know, sit on the bottom. I had a PVC pipe filled with fish entrails and squid. And you know, before I even sat down, here come those stingrays. They know I got food for them. And if you know anything about stingrays, they, they eat by sucking the food up in through their mouth. And they have these really powerful lungs. And they're, the, the suction is like a vacuum. So I hadn't even situated myself, and there's a dozen stingrays all around me, sucking all over it. In fact, I ended up going home with a hickey on the arm. <laughs> but I untwisted that PVC pipe, and then all the fish parts go up in the air, and the stingrays are just sucking all that up. Well, that was an experience. Really was an experience about how these conditioned creatures know to come for food every single day. And the tourists, of course, come to enjoy that, to feed them and watch them be fed. <coughs> well, we went on and did the rest of the diving for the week, and the very last day, here the captain of the ship, is, of the boat, is taking us back to Stingray City. And my buddy and I looked at each other, and we kind of shook our head, and the captain saw. And he came over and said, do you guys not want to go? We said, well, we kind of did that already. We were hoping our last dive might be a little more exciting. And he said, I'll tell you what, just as any good captain knows, he had something in his back pocket. He said, I'll tell you what, as we enter the cove, if you guys get all geared up, you can get off there and then check out the coral reefs. There's some things to see around there. And then you can swim back to the boat when you're done. We thought that was a pretty good idea. So we got to the edge of the reef, edge of the cove. We stepped off the swim step down into the the coral heads and the garden of coral heads, and it was beautiful. We putzed around and looked at all the tiny stuff, which is one of the things I love to do. And after 10 or 15 minutes, I turned around and I saw eight cuttlefish, cuttlefish in a row. It was like a chorus line. They were perfectly balanced midwater. And they were moving very slightly, but in, in, in synchronicity, they were moving together. Again, it was like a beautiful dance. And then something really interesting happened. We moved forward and they moved back. And we moved back and they moved forward. And that lasted for about 10 minutes. We were part of the dance. It was an amazing experience being present, fully present with those eight cuttlefish. 
And then, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Maybe I thought I needed to take a picture, or maybe we got too close, but all of a sudden they disappeared in a cloud of brown ink. And when the ink settled, the cuttlefish were gone. I'll never forget the present I got from being present with those cuttlefish that day. And we're going to move all the way to the Pacific Coast. On the back side of Catalina Island is a place called Farnsworth Banks. And it's really rough seas sometimes, so if you're going to dive there, it has to be calm. The ocean has to be calm or the boat won't even take you there. On this particular day, we had a dive plan all outlined, which is what you have to do. And here we were, we dropped down, ready to go, follow our dive plan. We were checking out a wall there, and it was really pretty baby octopus and coral heads and nudibranch and all kinds of cool things to see on the wall. And for some reason, I'm not sure why, I turned and looked to my right. And to the right, and just above me, was a humpback whale. I took a deep breath. And the whale, very slowly, was moving by. And there was a baby tucked underneath its right dorsal, right dorsal uh, pectoral fin. As a mom, I could feel what that whale felt. I knew that whale could feel what I was feeling. There was a deep and powerful connection there. And I just hung there in the water and watched. The dive plan went out the window. What I learned from that experience was to go with the flow, to let things come as they may. I also learned when we got it back on the boat that every whale has their own song. Every whale. And the, the captain of the boat had a microphone because we didn't hear anything when we were down there. But he had a microphone. He said, my microphone will pick up the sound of any whales that are nearby. And whale sounds, whale songs, can be heard 100, 500, sometimes 1,000 miles away. As soon as he dropped that microphone, we heard whale songs. Every whale has a unique song. They were singing in harmony. And of course, I wondered, was one of them calling that mother and baby? Were they communicating to each other that way? The other lesson I learned from that dive was that we all need to sing our own song. I was in Hawaii doing another planned, another planned dive that didn't go exactly as planned. We were approaching the dive spot when the captain of the boat said, check it out, you guys, there's a pot of whales. We looked at him and we said, can you get in? And he didn't say anything, so we got in. There was about eight whales there and about 10 of us. All the whales took off as soon as we got into the water, except one. As I turned around, that whale was right in front of me, looking me in the eye. A powerful connection was made that moment. And then I heard clicking noises. And I turned to my dive buddy, Karina, and we both nodded because the whale started to take off and we decided we were going to check out where it was going. And it was making these loud clicking noises, so we followed it about 250 yards or so. It was a ways. Then we saw this big cloud of dust, sand. We knew something was going on down there, so we decided to check it out because that whale was circling above us now, making these clicking noises. So we sunk down another 40 feet or so and we found out that underneath all that stilt that was stirred up was a huge fishing net. And something was toss, being tossed around and struggling in that fishing net. So right away, at, at the same moment, Karina and I both reached in our leg and got out the shears and we cut that fishing net. As it dropped to the ground, a whale, a juvenile whale, came swimming out. We watched it join the other sperm whale up at the top. We assumed it's mom, and off it went. But that's not the end of the story, because also tangled up in that net were thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of baby fish. They were swimming all over the place, and we, we both felt like we were mom. 
to all these little babies that we had just freed. So we stayed down as long as we could, and then we had to, had to head back to the boat. When we got to the boat, we got our head up out of the water, holding on to the ladder, and I started laughing, because Karina had fish in her hair, and I had fish in my hair, and they were in my wetsuit. So we took off our gear, and we hooked it onto the boat, and we sat on the swim step, step and took off our wetsuits, and emptied the, the wetsuits out into the water to let all those babies go free. We had done something good, something really good that day. That dot was a celebration of freedom. Over the years, the ocean has given me many, many pearls of wisdom. Like the decorator crab who walks along the bottom of the ocean, picks up stuff and puts it on its shell to camouflage itself from prey. The only problem is, sometimes it carries around so much stuff that it can't move anymore. Do you ever do that? Do you ever carry around stuff that weighs you down? Or the lobster, who has to shed its, its shell 20 to 40 times in its life. It spends most of its life, its life getting ready to shed its shell, growing bigger, right? Or getting ready to have a new shell. And once it sheds its shell, when it's so uncomfortable and it can't handle life anymore in that tight, confined space, it has to let go of that shell. And then it's vulnerable because it has no protection until the next shell grows. Sometimes growing is really hard. But you know, those are stories for another time.